Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Uh, today, I am so excited to have Ian McGregor joining me, uh, talking about his new book, The Lighthouse of Stalingrad, The Hidden Truth at the Heart of the Greatest Battle of World War II. Uh, and I really learned a, a ton um, from, from this book, so I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, Ian McGregor is an author and editor. Uh, he has published many books on the Second World War on the Eastern Front, and his research has taken him to archives in Leningrad, Moscow, and Volgograd. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and his writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Spectator, and BBC History Magazine. Ian, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the clocks have gone forward in the UK by an hour, as they usually do, which herald springtime so the sun's <laughs> yeah. shining outside and i'm uh, i'm working from home today in the day job so uh well i had to so i'm in washington dc right now and for setting this up uh you know i was it's it's it was morning time and so i'm trying to do some math so i just googled like if it is 11 a.m in <laughs> washington dc what time is it in london and that's how we we luckily google yeah, yeah. led us to the right place yeah yeah no it's uh, it's 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 lovely. It's uh, it's it, as we all, as many of your listeners will know. It's nice to work from home a few days a week, so uh, you can collect your thoughts more. So I'm hoping this is absolutely a good talk we have. Wonderful. Um, well, yeah. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, really excited about this book. Um, I was with some friends this weekend actually at a a, a bar in Washington D.C. and I had your book with me because I was reading it on the train. And I sat it down on the table and my friend's like, oh, I was just on the beach last week and I saw somebody reading that and <laughs> I didn't think of your book as a beach read, but uh, I can confirm that there is at least one person out there on a leisurely beach trip reading The Lighthouse of Stalingrad. Uh, so well, I thought I would. So there's a kind of, there's a, there's a link to the sea. Maybe that's the reason. I'm, I'm trying to think of yeah. the reason, but uh yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've I've read lots of uh, of uh, history, military history books while I've been sure. relaxing on the beach. But well, and nice really, it could that. it's good to hear. Maybe it could be a commentary on on my type of friends too. Uh, yeah, more true. so than <laughs> no comment. So, uh, so this is the first I read. This is the the first book that you've written about World War II specifically. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as you said in the intro, I've, I've published dozens and dozens of books on uh, 20th century history and obviously within that World War I and World War II. Uh, but as a writer, yeah. Well, what inspired you to, to write this book about Stalingrad? Uh, I've, I've been fascinated by specifically this battle since I was nine years old and my parents bought me for my birthday an illustrate. I mean, I've always loved history, so they, they, they're always feeding me lots of books and things like that. So I had an illustrated history of the greatest battles in history. And the one that really stood out for me, uh, other than the Battle of Kenai, which is in ancient Rome, uh, was and very similar to Stalingrad, actually, the ending was Stalingrad. Because obviously you can relate to that because you're looking at a city, uh, an urban city, modern city. So you can think in your, in your as a child, you, you're thinking, well, that's that's very much like where I'm living. Uh, and it just captured my imagination because obviously the banner headline was greatest battle of the Second World War. So I wanted to find out as much as I could about that. And then uh, I was just very lucky as a teenager. And this is way back in the 80s, early 80s. As a teenager, my 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 parents paid for me to go on to a, on a student uh, exchange trip to uh, the Soviet Union, as was to Russia. So that was to Leningrad and the environs outside Leningrad. And, and again, that really stirred within me uh, a passion about Russian history, especially modern Russian history, twentieth century modern history, whether it's the Russian Civil War in nineteen seventeen to nineteen twenty two, twenty three, or Stalin taking over, and then obviously the, the the their part of the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War, is just fascinating. And then the Cold War, so all that is super super interesting to me. Uh, but like I said, it's uh, my publisher after after my previous book, which was on the Berlin War. My publisher said to me, 
what book would you like to write next? What, what really captures your imagination that you could really get your teeth into? And I you know, didn't need a second thought, really. I said, well, I'd love to, to do one on Stalingrad. But as I'm sure we'll talk about in, in the next hour, it has to be something completely new and different. The world doesn't didn't really need another book on Stalingrad, really. Uh, I just, but I, I hoped yeah. it would if I told it through an original angle, which I, I hope that's what I've captured with the book. Well, you know, that's it's really interesting um, because my my conventional wisdom also is well, you know, Stalingrad. It's so it's such a documented battle. There's been so many books written about it. But one of the reasons why I was I was actually kind of excited to read this book. And why I I actually I liked um, I'm a big fan of lots of context in which we'll get into, yeah. and um, I love that you provided a lot of context in your book because I had, I had heard a lot about Stalingrad, but I didn't know any of the specifics really, and maybe it's a, a generational thing mm-hmm. where you know I've I've I know there's books that have been written uh, however long ago about Stalingrad, but I actually I was surprised at at how little. Maybe not how little I knew, but I, how much I learned just about the battle itself. Yeah. Um, so, well, maybe let's just let's just get right into the battle, uh, the siege of Stalingrad. Would you would you say it's the siege of Stalingrad or the battle of Stalingrad? What's well, the proper? It's, battle. it's, it's a campaign. Okay. And it's not just as I, I say in my talk, especially to students. We all say it's obviously known as the battle of Stalingrad and as the city of Stalingrad on the River Volga in southern Russia. But it was really the Stalingrad front, which is why it's a battle of millions of, of combatants and why there's well over a million and a half killed. Uh, it's because it was along a long front. So it's not just in this city that that stretches like a, a ribbon along the river for about 20, 25 miles. So that's you know nearly 40 kilometers long. It's big urban sprawl of a city. But it's the hinterland outside of it which strategically is a front. So that's why you've got this clash of armies, millions strong, and consisting of thousands of aeroplanes, thousands of tanks, motorized vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's the Battle of Stalingrad, but it means so much more. It's, it's, it's a whole area. Yeah. Well, this, the, the, the siege itself lasts from September of 1942 to February of 1943, but I actually wanted to start a little bit before that uh, in 1941, um, when when Germany invades uh, the Soviet Union, maybe we can just start there and yes. um, go leading up to to yeah. uh, September of 1942. So uh, 1941, when Germany invades the Soviet Union, uh, tell us a little bit about that invasion um, um, the, at the very beginning. Who's winning? Who's losing? Sure. Um, Sure. You know, the troop numbers. Uh, give us a little context. Well, I mean, uh, the previous year, so 1941, 22nd of June, 1941, Operation Barbarossa uh, jumps off. And that's that's Adolf Hitler and his Axis allies. But primarily, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's Nazi Germany's key campaign of the whole of the Second World War. Uh, his ultimate goal was to destroy Bolshevism. I mean, the, the, the Nazi ideology... The, uh, the, the obvious target and adversary was Stalin's uh, Russia. Uh, so that was, that, that was the whole point of the operation, was to knock the Soviet Union out through the war and destroy Bolshevik Russia. Uh, ironically, it was Stalin's uh, Soviet Union, especially their mineral wealth and the oil that had bankrolled uh, Hitler's expansion to the West to so the previous year with obviously the invasion of Poland, followed by uh, then the invasion west to, to take France, the Low Countries, drive Britain out off the continent, continental Europe, uh, so whether they were themselves besieged on, on, on our island. Uh, that had all been achieved really through, obviously, famously, we always talk about this, this big bl- motorised blitzkrieg of, of uh, Hitler's armoured divisions and combined arms with the Luftwaffe, aerial attacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But you need oil. You need you need oil to drive a twentieth century motorized army. Uh, in, in in terms, I mean, obviously, the German army was was heavily reliant on horse drawn uh, vehicles as well as foot soldiers just marching along. But their their Panzer armies and motorized divisions needed oil. Germany Germany's mineral wealth and oil wealth was negligible. 
and, and Stalin had bankrolled that. So the attack the following year, 22nd of June, 1941, even though there was lots of information and uh, intelligence reports, not just from Stalin's own people, but from the Western allies like Britain, for instance, was telling him German troops, Axis troops are um, uh, massing in their millions on your on your borders to attack. He just didn't believe it because he was thinking long term, I've been supplying uh, Nazi Germany for the best part of two years in terms of all this. He was completely surprised, right? So it took him by surprise. And, um, you know, it's been argued probably correctly that he just didn't want it to live. Psychologically, it was a damaging blow to him. He just didn't believe it was happening. And from that, he just kind of rabbit in headlights. So this massive invasion over well over three million men, three giant armies, uh, north, centre and south, north to drive along the Baltic coast, capture Leningrad, second biggest city and communication hub on the European side of Russia. Uh, The centre to obviously drive through uh, towards Moscow, take out the centralised hub of the whole country uh, and capture that. And then the Southern Army is is to do what uh, where the fighting is at the moment that everyone's talking about in Ukraine. Go drive through Ukraine, drive through Belarusia, and go into the south, into the Caucasus, where this mineral wealth was that was coming up uh, and being delivered by Stalin's trains and trucks to hit Hitler anyway. Uh, so it, and it worked to a degree. Uh, it wasn't the 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 one summer campaign that had worked the year before against France, where it knocked France out of uh, the Second World War in eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks, that wasn't repeated. You're just talking about a far, far bigger country. And this this uh, kind of ideologically driven uh, uh, argument Hitler had that you just had to kick in the door of Soviet Russia, and which he believed was rotten to the core with Bolshevism, and the whole edifice was collapsed, just didn't happen. So even though his armies were plunging hundreds and hundreds of kilometres into the country and capturing cities, like Smolensk and Kiev, besieging Leningrad, getting to the gates of Moscow, uh, driving down south to the Caucasus, they were still being held up by fierce Soviet resistance. Even though they, they by the end of the summer campaign and by the end you know, going towards winter time, they killed nearly three million Soviet troops and captured three million Soviet troops. They destroyed the bulk yeah. of the Western Army of the Soviet Union, and it really wasn't. And you you write a, a little bit about this too. I think a lot of people, you know, in hindsight, the thought is that like Hitler's, you know, he, invading the Soviet Union was like his like that was such a, a ludicrous thing for him to do. You know, if you look right up to that that invasion, if you look at the Soviet Union in their campaign against Finland, um, like the Soviet Union had like a very kind of weak military um, uh, campaign. In, in Finland. And then also, too, he, Hitler didn't believe that the Soviet economy um, was modern enough to, to compete against uh, his, yeah. his, well, his vastly was, modernized yeah, German it, force. With the Winter War and Stalin trying to capture a, a huge chunk of Finland, it's very much like what's going on in the Ukraine today. It's He just arrogantly thought that the mass of his armies and the amount of armor that they had uh, and mechanized troops that they could easily take on and beat the Finns. But he was dealing with a very highly trained, highly motivated uh, Finnish army uh, that was well supplied uh, by by the Allies, by, by Germany as well. And they really gave the Soviet uh, invading army a bloody nose. And they weren't, the, the Soviet army that was attacking wasn't well coordinated, had low morale, troops weren't as well trained as they should have been. Their leadership, the military leadership, had been heavily uh, damaged by the the purges uh, leading up to that that campaign that Stalin had instigated in the late thirties, where he you know chopped the head off the the main military leadership of the Red Army. So it was a disaster, and obviously other people outside, especially a uh, uh, German uh, military high commander, watching this, thinking, "Aha! Look at look at how badly they've performed here." They are, it reinforced the fact that they were ripe for the picking. But saying that, even though Hitler wanted this to happen, wanted this invasion to happen, when the Wehrmacht came to wargaming a strategy that they would implement in Operation Barbarossa, they were 
a lot of the main military leaders were seeing this as, well, this is quite impractical in terms of how many men will need the logistics that's involved. This country or territory is 10 times bigger than what we did to France. Uh, the amount of men we've got to capture, you know, and what, you know, when you capture these millions of men, do you have the logistics and the actual uh, wherewithal to take them prisoner and actually deal with them properly? There was nothing of that in place. So, there was a lot of scepticism in the, the German high command, but Hitler and Hitler's policies had delivered a lot of success over the last 18 months. They, they'd smashed the Western Allies. They'd taken France, which they'd never done in the Great War, uh, 1914 to 18. So he had this self-belief. So they followed him, albeit you know with some scepticism. They still followed him willingly into the East to think, maybe we can do this. But as I was saying... By the time you get, uh, what are we talking about? By the time you're getting, say, five months into this operation uh, and they're outside of the gates of Moscow, they're outside of the gates of Leningrad, they're about to plunge into the Caucasus, that's where the Russian winter hits. They're not prepared for it. But equally, then they just weren't prepared and it came as a shock to how fiercely Soviet forces were putting up a fight. Yes, they were being destroyed en masse by... The, the methods of Blitzkrieg, as in, you know, these motorized divisions would surround whole static red armies and then just, just you know, destroy them or or capture them in bulk and then destroy them. Uh, the, again, Hitler just didn't believe the the, the the pools of manpower that Stalin would be able to call upon to keep delivering fresh divisions, which completely shocked everybody. So... By the time of 1942, and we're getting towards what are, they, what are they going to be their plans, you know, the German army had had a, a, a severe bloody nose because they'd been counterattacked outside the gates of Moscow and not just outside the gates of Moscow, all along the line. So this line stretched from the, the Baltic coast all the way down to the Caucasus, is well over a thousand kilometers, if not 1500 kilometers. All along that part, you've got these mini, not coordinated, as some would say, coordinated giant offensive. It was a series of counteroffensives. As, as the Soviets could perceive that the Germans were struggling to uh, handle the, the, the winter conditions, but also that they, they were right at the edge of their, their, uh, their capacity to, to actually carry on fighting because they'd lost so many vehicles, lost a lot of men. They lost more men to, to frostbite than they did to actually fighting. And so, so by the by end... The, sorry, go on. Right. So by the time they get to September of 1942, um, the... It's it's not the same army it was a year ago. Uh, things are no, no, no. things mean, are very they, different. Again, yeah, I mean their the, their plans for forty two and and and, and you got to remember that by the time that they started this operation that would ultimately end at Stalingrad in nineteen forty two in September, that the the Christmas of forty one going into forty two that's when obviously Hitler joined Imperial Japan, his fascist ally, and declared war on the United States. So he's now he's in this global campaign. Uh, and it, it's much bigger stakes to play for. And to be a winner uh, and taking this massive gamble, he now knows he he does need, he needs oil, he needs the mineral wealth that uh, Southern Russia can give him uh, to carry on fighting this war that's now on a bigger uh, playing field. Let's let's talk about then uh, the city of Stalingrad itself and the, the geography and why Stalingrad. You touched on this a little bit. And I know you, you've talked a little bit about uh, resources. Um, so Stalingrad it, itself, that is that would be considered in the southern um, part of Russia, correct? Yeah, it's in, it's in southern Russia. It's on the banks of the Volga. The, Vo the Volga River stretches from the Caspian Sea in the south all the way up to uh, basically north of Moscow. It's well over a thousand kilometers long. Um, over 1,500 kilometers long, I should say. Uh, over five, 600 tributaries feed into it. I mean, it's, it's very much like the Mississippi is to uh, America and, and how valuable the Mississippi was strategically during the American Civil War and how both sides really needed to grab the Mississippi because economically and supply routes-wise, it's fundamental to for one side or the other to have it to, to, to maintain momentum. So Stalingrad, basically, uh, its original name was Tsaritsyn. Uh, it had been there since medieval times. And, and again, like the Mississippi, it's it was one of a number of, of uh, small villages that just grew into trading posts, then into towns, and then into major commercial centres as we progress through the centuries. 
So by the time the Germans uh, arrived uh, outside the city in September 42, uh, you're looking at a place that it's a, it's a major urban industrial center. It was one of the major places in southern Russia. Stalin in the 30s had poured a lot of uh, Soviet money, but also a lot of Western investment, especially from America, into turning this uh this city into uh, what he would call a showpiece city, which I mean, it was named after him, Stalingrad. And that was going to be one of these satellite Soviet cities that would almost be a replica of what you could get if you lived in Moscow. So you'd have boulevard parks, department stores, big libraries, theatres, the best hospitals, the best schools. You write a little bit too. I thought this was very interesting because I'm from the Midwest uh, here in America. Yeah. Uh, you write that uh, the city itself was almost like an industrial American Midwest city, um, yeah, I mean, where, where I, I mean, industry I, was, was thriving. Exactly. I mean, I, I've, I've been to the Midwest quite a lot, and you know, I've been to Chicago quite a lot. It, it reminded me, I mean, physically the shape of it is different to Chicago. Uh, like I said, the whole city of Stalingrad uh, was basically uh, situated along the river. It's like a long ribbon, for over 40 kilometers long. At any, it's deep. At its deepest point, it's probably only two kilometers in depth. So it's not like uh, this homogenous blob that most cities are like, that just spreads out in all in all directions from the compass. It was it was literally layered along the bluffs of this river, and uh, and obviously for obvious reasons because that's where the trading's being done. That's where all your warehouses are. And by the time the Germans arrive, that's where they've got these giant factories. Which to get back to my point, the the one of the key places of the fighting that would happen uh, was in the north of the city where this giant, what was called the factory district was. And one of those giant factories, there was three of them, uh, was actually designed and built by the Ford Motor Company. And that gets back to all this Western investment that had been ploughed in in the 1930s because Stalin originally wanted this. It was called the tractor factory. It was supposed to be making farming equipment that some of it was for Russia, but the bulk of it was going to get exported because it would it would bring the government lots of uh, import imported wealth. Uh, but as you do, as America did, as Britain did, once you're at war, you have to turn over a lot of these factories from not making what they're supposed to be making. They make arms, they make equipment, they make tanks, they make armored boats, armored planes, and that's why the city of Vol- uh, I almost said Volgograd, that's why the city of Stalingrad was a military target because that's what it was doing. It was churning out armored boats armoured planes, T-34 tanks, all that kind of thing. And so to get back to my earlier point about this, uh, Case Blue was what it was called, the the, the summer uh, campaign, the year after Barbarossa, which failed. This campaign was to, was to plunge into southern Russia and capture the oil. Stalingrad was really just a, a city on a map. It was strategically, it was going to be the furthest east this new offensive would reach. And it was, it was just to get the army, a portion of the army, on the Volga River because then that protected, cemented the, the bulk of the army's flank as it then veered 90 degrees and went down into the south, into the Caucasus to capture the oil. That was the fundamental goal of that summer campaign. Very much like the year before because the Soviets were putting up a big fight, they were resisting. The German army was uh, losing men and material. Hitler had to take a gamble. He's thinking the Caucasus, that this big campaign's not going to work. I'm not going to achieve the goals that I wanted to. I've got to come out of this with something to justify this vast expenditure in human life and material. We're going to, all eyes will now go back to Stalingrad. We're going to capture or destroy Stalin's city. So, so Stalingrad is standing in the way of, um, if Stalingrad falls for, for what this means to the Soviet Union, that will just give the German army a, um, uh, uh, a very easy path towards these oil fields and other resources. Well, that, that, that was the that thing. Right? Yeah, I mean, German propaganda had always said, uh, especially over the last year that they'd been at war with Russia, that they would break the back of the Red Army and they would eventually succeed in destroying Western Russia, European Russia. And their kind of demarcation line of where that was was, they wanted to go past Moscow, but they were always going to probably stop at the Ural Mountains, which is about 500, 600, 700 miles further east of Moscow. And then that line continues. You follow that southwards, and then you're heading down towards the Caspian Sea, you're heading down towards Iran. That's where the Volga is. So that's naturally to a lot of German commanders. They were thinking, if we get to the Volga, we've pretty much, A, we'll have, we will have hopefully destroyed the Red Army in front of us. 
and we would have split the country in two. And if we split the country in two, they'll either sue for peace on our terms or we actually can, can continue this fight and we'll destroy them completely. And they very much believe that because obviously you and I are looking at this in hindsight. We know what's going to happen at Stalingrad and we ultimately know the Soviet Union is going to win the Second World War. But at that point in time, there had just been one victory after another for the German army over the Soviets. Both sides had seen the the way that the Winter War had worked, where the Germans hadn't succeeded in their goals. Everyone was attributing really to the winter weather. It hadn't been the Soviets that had defeated them. It was the weather. So in Hitler's mind and in a lot of his loyal commanders' mind, their feeling was, well, we can still beat this army. They, they've never defeated us yet. And on the flip side, that's what the Red Army thought. They're thinking, what are we going to do? They can literally, they're going anywhere at will that they want to. We're, we're, we're managing to hold the line to a degree, but we're getting smashed time after time. And it's it's costing us about 10 to 15 times more uh, in terms of casualties and tanks and planes being destroyed to actually hold the line. Uh, so when by the time the Germans are striving for Stalingrad, the whole country, the Soviet Union, was thinking, well, this is make or break for us now. If we can't hold Stalin's city on the Volga, we'll lose the Volga, the country gets split in half, and then basically in a few months' time when the next summer campaign starts, then they really will capture the Caucasus. So that was the thinking at the time, yeah. that it really was kind of last roll of the dice for the Red Army. Um, let's start then at September of 1942 when um, the, uh, the the siege actually starts. Who were some of the players... <clears throat> Sorry, uh, who are some of the players on the German side and, and the Russian side? Who's who's in leadership in, for both of the armies? Well, on the German side, to get back to that point I made about uh, Barbarossa had been war gamed uh, before they actually started in forty one. It's just the uh, the irony is the commander that was in charge of the German Sixth Army that was now surrounding Stalingrad and about to attack was a guy called General Friedrich Paulus. Uh, and there's the mistake. Sometimes there's a mistake. People call him von Paulus. So he didn't have a von. It's just Friedrich Paulus. But he had been in charge. He was a brilliant uh, administrator. He was a brilliant staff officer. Uh, and there's no argument about that. And he, he'd worked very well uh, all the way through uh, the war in the West. And then in the first year of the war in Russia. That's that's basically what he'd been doing. And he was one of the main guys who'd war-gamed this at the very beginning and, and actually had said, this this is very, you know, this will be so-so. This is quite impractical to do this, but they'd gone ahead and done it. Uh, but through happen chance, uh, the the guy who was going to command this, this, uh, this new offensive, von Reichenau, who Paulus reported to, died of a stroke. Uh, days before they were about to launch this offensive. So Hitler had promoted Paulus into the hot seat, primarily, I would argue, because he was a guy that wasn't going to question Hitler's orders, wasn't going to question the command structure, which Hitler had found the year before when Barbarossa was failing. A lot of his commanders were were arguing with him, and he'd fired quite a lot, a few senior commanders because of that. So he wanted Paulus. So Paulus was the main driver. Like I said, he was a brilliant administrator, brilliant staff officer, but he wasn't a frontline commander. And that would hamper uh, the Sixth Army when it really came to the, the crunch of when they're fighting in this, this city, this new urban combat. Uh, he just It just wasn't something he was used to. On the flip side, he would be against a man total opposite in character and ability uh, to him. And that was a guy called General Vasily Chukov. And Chukov would be in charge of the 62nd Army, and they were designated to defend the center of the city. And Chukov was everything Paulus wasn't. He was, uh, A, he was a diehard communist. You couldn't really say Paulus was a diehard Nazi. He just wasn't. Even though, to be fair, he'd gone along with commanding the city or had been part of the senior management of the 6th Army that had, that had helped commit atrocious atrocities as they were making their way through the eastern territories. Uh, you know, the Sixth Army logistically helped uh, a lot of what happened with the Holocaust in Ukraine was and, and Belarusia was was on their, their doorstep. And Paulus was part of that. But he wasn't a diehard Nazi, whereas Chukov was a diehard communist. Uh, he'd led a regiment, age 19 in the Russian Civil War, he'd led a regiment of cavalry. He was, I mean, he was that good a frontline commander. Uh, 
hard bitten, hard nosed, I should say, uh, followed orders implacably, wasn't averse to shooting people himself if he thought they weren't uh, towing the line or following orders correctly or had disobeyed orders, obviously. Uh, so he's the kind of guy you want in charge of, of leading what was a really tenacious uh, diehard defence against an overwhelming force that Paulus was commanding against him, and, and that's what he did. And it's very, when I was reading the, the combat diaries of both the armies, it's very telling that at no point was Churkov ever more than, say, 200 metres away from the bitterest fighting on the front line in the city uh, during the Battle of Stalingrad, whereas Paulus for the bulk of the time of the fighting, he was at least more than 20, 25 kilometres away in, in HQ. And again, that kind of shows you the characters. But then when it drills down to what I talk about in my book, what I wanted to offer the reader was, instead of offering the overall strategy of the battle, which, you know, you can go to people like David Glantz, who's fantastic. Obviously, Anthony Beevil's book on Stalingrad is amazing. They offer the whole story of the whole campaign. I wanted to drill down to a very human story and talk about just two single units, two divisions opposing each other in the centre of the city, one of which reported ultimately to Paulus, one of which ultimately reported to Chukov, who I've just talked about, 71st Infantry Division on the German side and the 13th Guards Rifle Division on the, the Soviet side. They both fought for those five months from the beginning right to the end of the battle, slugging it out in the centre of the city, uh, Street by street, building by building, room by room, floor by floor, uh, and they suffered horrendous casualties. So you're talking about a division of men, anywhere between nine to twelve thousand men, and they both ended up with less than two hundred of the original number of combatants they took into the city. So you've got that kind of thing, and they're, so they're the kind of characters that I wanted to talk about. Well, let's go right into the fighting then, and let's let's talk about some of those characters. So um, I guess what's the, in the initial days of the siege, what's the fighting like? And then um, talk a little bit. So the book is The Lighthouse of Stalingrad. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about then the, the Lighthouse of Stalingrad and, and buildings sure. like that. Well, like I was saying right at the top of the talk, it's, this is a, it's, it's a battle that will, it, it's almost like Verdun in France uh, in the Great War. This just sucks in. It's like a vortex that just sucks in hundreds of thousands of troops on both sides as the battle rages uh, back and forth in the city. Uh, as I was saying before about Stalingrad, the city itself, geographically, is the bulk of it is on the western side of the Volga River. So on, on the eastern side, which is where the Soviets still held the line, uh, you've got staging posts and landings and landing platforms but it's all very small scale in terms of buildings and, and and people living there, population. Stalingrad, on the other hand, on the western side, on the Volga, which is what the Germans were invading, uh, that's that's got you know well over seventy odd thousand buildings. Uh, it's got this giant factory in the north, giant factory complex in the north, a modern city in the centre, and then the existing old city of Tsaritsyn in in the south. That, that's just cobbled streets and wooden shacks and buildings, no more than two to three stories high. In the centre of the city, which is what you and I were talking about, that's the modern city that's been built. So it's got buildings that are five, six stories high. It's got boulevards, theatres, apartment blocks, all that kind of thing that, that we know as a modern city should. Uh, that's where the main bulk of the fighting is. So Paulus originally has a roughly around about 140, 150,000 troops. Uh, so that you're talking about 20 to 25 divisions. Uh, he's got the, uh, the fourth panzer army coming up from the south because Hitler switched them from going down further into the Caucasus. And he said, you know, you're capturing Stalingrad now. You're going to come up from the south and take the city that way. So you've got the sixth army coming in from the north and, and, the, west, and, and the west. And then from the south, you've got the fourth panzer army. Uh, the Soviets have been retreating all the way through falling back, falling back, falling back. So they're now in the city. Uh, lots of troops will be coming on echelon to reinforce them. But these are the troops that had been defending the centre of Russia because they'd been expecting this new campaign that had been launched in 42. Stalin, 
and his generals had been expecting that Hitler would just repeat what he'd done the year before and they're going to smash their way through because they want to, their ultimate goal is to capture Moscow. As soon as they realised, ah, actually, they're not attacking the centre, they're going south, they're going south for the oil. It took a while for the penny to drop, but that was going to happen. But by the time it did drop, they are starting to send divisions down to the south to protect the south. But they're coming in on echelon because, you know, it takes time to move all these divisions down. So what would happen, which I'll explain to the listeners, as this battle's raging for the city, they've got to hold the city. They succeed in stopping the Germans taking the whole of the, the city on the West Bank. They're holding out through little pockets, uh, as the Ukrainians are doing in Bakhmut at the moment. So they're... But because they're holding on, it allows these fresh divisions that are coming on the eastern side of the Volga to be, then be sent in the nick of time piecemeal across the city through a hail of artillery, German artillery shells and aircraft uh, assaults. They get across the city and they just keep this tenuous defence, tenacious defence going that causes what I was saying, this vortex of the Germans are just losing so many men because... Ultimately, what we're talking about here is urban combat, which the German blitzkrieg tactics just weren't used to. They're more used to via combined arms. They smash through the, 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 front, the front of any extended line through these pincer points, which then they can drive wedges in behind the enemy that's static, come behind them, surround them, then reduce them, and then they work on the next line. That's how blitzkrieg works. But when you're in a, a, an urban area, where you're fighting, as I was saying, street by street, building by building, room by room, that's a different type of battle. And that's what the Soviets were depending on because now this, this new tactic of storm groups where you have small groups of men, so instead of massed frontal assaults, you have these small groups heavily armed with submachine guns, grenades, flamethrowers. They're not just trying to attack you from the front. They're trying to go sneak behind you through the sewers, through jumping through buildings, jumping over, but jumping from roof to roof, that kind of thing. It's very dirty. Well, it's called the Germans call it Rattenkrieg, Rats War, and that's what I'm talking about. A vortex. You just, it's impossible yeah. to figure out how best to combat this. And the German way of doing it was, they they ruled the skies over the city basically for the bulk of the fighting because they shot the, the Russian air force out of the, the skies at the beginning. They just bombed uh, from the air. They bombed with artillery assaults. And they it was just this mass kind of assaults that they were doing. But that's just the kind of fighting the Russians wanted. They wanted the Germans to come on to them. Uh, yeah. So to get to the lighthouse, the lighthouse was just a code name for a building. So like I was saying, at the center of the, the fighting, as the Germans were edging their way ever closer to the Volga, capturing the city, building by building, block by block, street by street. By the time you get to the lighthouse, this uh, the Soviet defence was in, in very small isolated pockets, no more than 200 metres deep until you get to the Volga. They're hanging on by the skin of, the skin of their teeth. Germans owned probably or, or occupied probably about at least 90% of the city. Uh, the lighthouse found itself in no man's land. And it was just a large apartment block that had originally been built by for the party elite and for technicians and engineers who worked in the factory district to the north. If you were somebody, you want to live in this building because it had the latest technology. It had hot and cold running water, gas mains, electricity, uh, very comfortable living compared to what you normally get. And, and fundamentally, it was built with reinforced girders. So despite all the carnage that was going on around it, and there were several buildings very much in the same architectural design as this building. These were the, the, the smashed, smashed out hulks that were dotted around the, the center of the city that, that, that both sides were fighting for because they could turn them into mini fortresses. So this building uh, called the Lighthouse uh, was in the center between the lines uh, and it was codenamed the Lighthouse by the Russians because you're at the top of this four-story building it gives you a perfect view, 360 degree view, five kilometers in any direction. You'll get to see what the enemy's doing. The Germans want it because for the exact same reason, they can see where the Russians are now sending reinforcements across the Volga to these lines, that they're, these final lines that they're trying to capture. Uh, so Germans the, the, were by a storm group and the, the Russians captured it, gave it the code name, the Lighthouse. And that's where this legend begins that I talk about in my book that 
Soviets have been believing for the last 80 years, which my research proved, well, it's, it's more propaganda than truth. So this, uh, so the lighthouse of Stalingrad, which also is um, referred to as Pavlov's house, uh, exactly, correct? Yeah, that, that's that's the legend. Is Pavlov's house? Yeah. Um, so the the types of fighting that so Russian troops are are there? Is it are there snipers in the windows? Are there machine guns set up? You know, what kind of resistance are people in this building putting up against the Germans? And then how are yeah. the Germans trying to overcome them in this building? Well. But yeah, I mean, it, both sides were very adept. I mean, the Germans were just as good at uh, sneaking into buildings, sneaking into houses, and then turning them into fortresses and fighting for them and maximizing the losses to the other side. The Soviets and the Germans were, were exactly the same. It was the same kind of fighting, really. But uh, this kind of thing, the, the legend of Pavlov's house is basically, it's a metaphor, and the, the way it was portrayed during the fighting itself, because that's where the legend comes from, is is a metaphor for how the Soviets were seeing their troops heroically fighting and sacrificing themselves to hold Stalin's city. So you're mentioning snipers. So there's a lot of legends and almost psychological terror tactics that the Soviets were putting on the Germans via their own propaganda and media was it's not safe to be around the city during the daytime uh, if you're Germans because we've got all these incredible sn- Soviet snipers that are just going to pick you off. People like Vasily Zaitsev, which is the, the the film, the famous film with Jude Law, Enemy at the Gates. He's Vasily Zaitsev, and he's taking out hundreds of Germans during the daytime. Uh, but then Pavlov's house was part of this 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 campaign as well. So he was a sergeant and a leader of a storm group. And the storm group was roughly about four to six people. That This is uh, the, uh, the commanding officer general of the 62nd Army, Chukov, wanted to ha- happen. It was his way of guerrilla tactics to, f- to take this new fight to the Germans. And they were armed to the teeth, submachine guns, bayonets, grenades. And it was his job to go out into no man's land to see if there were any Germans in the house because they knew there were, there were some there. And the legend that, Soviet school children have been taught the decades is they got to the house, they drove out or killed the Germans that were occupying the house. They then fortified it and they were reinforced with their own platoon who came out to see them. So you're talking about another 20 to 30 men. And the legend goes that all these men came from all 15 republics of the Soviet Union. So the whole Soviet Union is represented in this house. And then they proceeded to hold off in a very kind of Alamo style, uh, hugely overwhelming number of German forces that were trying to take this house for the reason I gave you, that it was strategically important. And the, and the propaganda and the story that you can buy in a bookshop, if you go, if you're in Moscow now, you could buy this story, is, you know, they fought off the, the basically the strength of a German division. And you talk about thousands of men, tanks, armoured cars, airstrikes, et cetera, et cetera. And Pavlov, led the fight to hold this for 58 days. Famously, that's what they call it. It was a 58-day siege, when in effect, if you check the records, they actually they actually occupied this building for the, the rest of the battle. So it's well over 100 days. It was, it's only called 58-day siege because that's when Pavlov was injured, wounded in battle, and he was shipped out, and that actually did happen. Yeah, well, then talk about that then. Talk about your research and um, how, you, how you learned that maybe some of the stories that have been told about uh, the lighthouse uh, yeah. or Pavlov's house. Um, how did you discover that that maybe those stories didn't match reality? Yeah, well, it was kind of obviously say spoiler alert. Uh, if you bought the book and you want to know, get a surprise. Don't listen to this. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd always, like I said, I've been fascinated by the battle. I've read, I've read many of the books on it, so I knew the legend of Pavlov's house, and that was that was. And it just so happened that Pavlov's house falls into the area of combat that I wanted to talk about with my book, as I mentioned, of these two divisions that were fighting against each other to, for control of the centre of the city. Uh, and what I did was, I was very lucky, uh, and considering it was in lockdown as well. So on the, the, the Soviet side, I managed to get an academic travel visa to go to Russia in lockdown and go to Volgograd. I befriended the, the one of the directors uh, of the museum there who was very happy and willing for me to come over because he was saying, you know, no one ever comes to this archive to look at our material. I'd love you to come over, uh, see what you can find. So Pavlov came from the 13th Guards Rifle Division. So I just, 
it, it, it's it's just doing detective work really it's is i gave the names of the units that are relevant to pavlov's house that were on that area uh who the officers were who the units were and i i i'd said to the museum if you have any testimonies from these men of these units that's what i want to come and look for and just very quickly, the backstory to this is the Panorama Museum in Volgograd is is incredible in terms of the material it's got. It's been going since the mid fifties. It's had in the fifties through the sixties, it had a nationwide campaign to say to ask the Russian people, "Did you fight at Stalingrad? If so, we would love to have some of your testimony. Write to the museum, and we will archive it." So the museum archives have thousands of pieces of material of the hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, a couple of million Soviet citizens that were involved in the fighting there. So I only, I only literally dipped my toe in the water in terms of research. I just wanted to look at one division of the 50 or so divisions that had fought there. Uh, So that's what I had. So when I went, I went there for, for uh, seven to eight days of research, I literally just sat in the archives and I could have looked at hundreds and hundreds of files. And I managed to look at three to 400 files that were connected to Pavlov's house. Then I looked at the German file of the division that was opposite. And for that, I, I, I advertised in the German press because lockdown, I couldn't get to the archives there because they're all closed. So I, I got about 35 to 40 uh, various replies, which gave me really valuable information about what had happened there. To surmise anyway, what I found out was that obviously Pavlov wasn't in charge of the uh the house it had there was a lieutenant afanisev was in charge and he'd been given the orders by captain zhukov to go there and zhukov was actually in charge of that bit of front it goes all the way up to regimental and divisional command you you just follow the paper trail and realize well actually this is not what happened this is what happened and that's what that's what my book will tell the story of but equally on the german side you realize that a, they didn't send a whole division to try and recapture this building. They didn't. They didn't have the strength at the time, and actually, the fighting had, had died down in that area. And I'd, and I'd said earlier on, they, they they captured the city in 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 pieces. So they captured the south, then they captured the center, the bulk of the center anyway. That, like I said, there were still small pockets of resistance that they never captured. But by the time that Pavlov's story is being told in the Russian press. Fighting had moved to the factory district in the north. That's where it was really, really at its fiercest. Uh, in the centre, by the time this reporter turns up at, at the house to talk about, well, you know, what's going on here, there's there's hardly any fighting. Both sides are kind of happy to let, other than sporadic, you know, firing at each other, and you might get the odd storm group goes across the, the the battleground no man's land to capture somebody to find out what's going on there is no big fighting going on so there was never any massive fighting or uh, legendary resistance for this house and that's what i i tell i was like and then i i just did more digging and found out well how did this story get told who was the reporter who in, invented or created this story and then how did that suddenly become a national story to where Stalin's favourite narrator on the radio, favourite broadcaster, tells the rest of the Russian public across the whole country, this is Pavlov, this is his house, this is the fighting that's being done to to stave off defeat. And that, that's what my book's ultimately about. So why do you think the story was told the, the way that it was? Uh, I, for, the, for, the, for the right reasons. I, I, I say this in talks. I'm not, I'm not trying... I'm certainly not trying to... Uh, What's the word? I'm 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 not trying to belittle anyone. I'm certainly not trying to say Pavlov himself wasn't a brave uh, soldier because he was. I mean, he he was seriously wounded ac- across the uh, the Great Patriotic War. He like many like many Red Army soldiers, he was wounded severely in battle. He was shipped back to the uh, past the line. He'd recover, and then he was shipped straight back out again, and he'd be fighting again. So he was wounded seriously three times in battle. Finished the war as a lieutenant of artillery, uh, and 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 won various medals. So it's not about that. It's not about kind of taking him down. Uh, but what it what it is 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 you can understand why the Soviets were doing it because as I, you and I were talking about earlier on. 
at the point they're fighting for their lives at Stalingrad, we, 80 years later, know what's going to happen. We know the Soviets are going to counterattack, surround the Sixth Army and destroy the best army the Wehrmacht ever had. We know that that's going to happen. But when they're fighting at the time, they didn't know that's happening. They think this is make or break. If we lose the city, we, we might well lose the Second World War on the Eastern Front. Lots of newspapers in the West, America, uh, America Britain, all around the Commonwealth. You, re- you look in the archives at newspapers, it could be the, the Washington Post, could be uh, New York Times, could be the Sunday Times, whatever. Uh, they're all reporting on their front pages day in, day out, what's going on at Stalingrad. All eyes were on Stalingrad because everybody thought this is the pivotal point. So to get to my po- to my comment before, I can understand why the Soviets needed to do what they did in terms of propaganda. They've got to uh, instill belief, gird the loins of the defenders that are hanging on by their fingernails, watching all their comrades die around them. By inventing these kind of stories or maximising the truth, we should say, the stories, it adds... uh, it instills in them more belief that they should hold out, as in if Pavlov can do this to hold out a house, I need to do my job too. And that, so I can understand why they did it. So today, the story of of um, of Pavlov's house is it still a story that 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 all Russians know? Yeah, I mean, it basically, uh, it's it's a story that becomes too big to fail because. The Pavlov's legend was established during the fighting, but then as they, as I talk about it in my book, as they then start rebuilding Stalingrad and then other cities in European Russia and Ukraine and Belarus, so places ironically like Sevastopol, Odessa, Kiev, Smolensk, all these cities need rebuilding. Building it costs money, time, and human effort. So Pavlov was, and the story of Pavlov was a great kind of, uh, it's almost like selling war bonds. It's a great shot in the arm for the nation to have someone like him traveling around the country saying, well, look, they're rebuilding Stalingrad. And one of the first buildings they rebuilt as quickly as they could was the house I've just, you know, almost cost me my life to defend. So he was almost like a poster boy uh, for the authorities to to encourage this rebuilding because a lot of it was done by voluntary and inverted commas vol- voluntary by uh, uh, communist groups and, and local militias that were that had said we'll, we'll do this in our own free time of our own free will to rebuild these cities, uh, and he was part of that. Uh, but that then feeds through to the next, all the way through the Cold War. So the story of Pavlov uh, was written up. It's been written up several times. It's been dramatically staged in the theatre in Moscow and in all the major theatres around the USSR. As I said, it was dramatized on national radio. And so somewhere, this kind of story is accepted now as the truth. So generations of Soviet school children have learned about the legend of Pavlov and, it, and accept it as the truth. Today, you, you will see dozens, if not hundreds of tourists, day in, day out, taking photos of the house that's been rebuilt, but they kept part of it as uh, uh, the original is, is it's almost like a skeleton uh, that's, that's stuck on the end of the new building that's been rebuilt because that that's that's to show it's like the Alamo it's to show that this did happen the building did exist and all the events that you've learned over your lifetime so far did happen yeah that's really interesting and uh, uh, and a parallel that I didn't think I'd be drawing with with your book in a book that I interviewed a, a previous guest on. So I had a, a history professor on who wrote a book about the American Revolution. And yeah. um, it was about some of the things that, that part of it was about some of the things that we believe to be true about the American yeah. Revolution that aren't actually true. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that comes to mind is growing up as a kid, um, you know, I, you, you, here in America, you hear a lot about Paul Revere and his midnight ride shouting that the British are coming, the British are coming, and um, everybody's now warned. But Paul Revere never would have said that because people considered themselves British here in America. But the story itself was just like, you know, it's like a heroic kind of act where Paul Revere is like going around and and, and stirring up. What it represents is, is what it represents. It represents the feeling of the time, of the period. 
and mm -hmm. the, I suppose the uh, the motivation people needed to fight. So uh, what I, it's what I say in the book. It's I you can endorse what they were doing at the time during the battle because they needed. You use any method, don't you? Use any kind of anything that will help you win, get over the line, to 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 really uh, uh, maintain morale. You will do. Everyone does. I mean, I'm sure there's 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 dozens of legends and stories that we've all learned of what the Allies did in any theatre of the war that you would, as we say, you could take a pinch of salt with. And and if you dug deep enough, you would find that it wasn't that person. It was a different person. And they didn't kill X amount of men. They killed this amount of men. It goes on and on. Whereas with, like I said, with Pavlov, I, I mean, I gave a school talk the other day. It's the 80th anniversary of the battle, of the victory, which was February just gone. Again, if you Google it, you will see that uh, Vladimir Putin's regime have made a made a as they always do. They make a big play of the commemoration. He gave his big speech, and politically, it's great to have that as the backdrop when you're talking about your your country's at war in Ukraine. And look, the the city was covered in banners that all relate to the victory in the Second World War. And lo and behold, one of the big banners that that, that bit pretty much took up a whole block of buildings, like six, seven story high was a banner of Sergeant Pavlov uh, because he is seen as one of the iconic heroes of the battle, like Zaitsev was the sniper. And I wonder if certainly here in America, whenever um, uh, if there is a, a story like a national story that uh, maybe some research comes out saying, well, that wasn't the truth. There's generally some pushback. I wonder yeah. if you've gotten pushback then on, um, this this research that you've done in in your findings um, are people generally receptive to to the revision of this story? Well, I, I'm I was going to say I, I'm talking primarily to a Western audience, aren't I? So it, it makes it slightly easier because that audience is, has access to a lot of books that have gone before me. So Anthony Beaver's book is amazing. It opened so many people's eyes to this is what actually happened on the Eastern Front. This is what actually happened at Stalingrad in terms of, say, for instance, I mean, it's a story today, actually, in terms of the blocking units, the Red Army imposed upon its own people, as in they were going to shoot troops that were that were retreating. Uh, that story came up today because apparently that's that's been going on on the front line in Ukraine. But also in terms of the amount of Soviet prisoners of war that actually helped the Germans. There was well over 50,000, 60,000 uh, Red Army prisoners of war, they were called Hiwis, uh, that were actually captured at the end of the battle. And obviously they were either imprisoned or, or killed outright. Those kind of stories a Western audience already knows because we've had, historic Western historians have had access. This small window has been allowed to us to actually access Soviet archives. So I managed to get to the archives in Volgograd, but I doubt many other people are. But just as one point, I, the very first night I was, I'd arrived in Volgograd, so I've yet to go into the archives, and I got a call in my hotel room from the reception. They said, "Oh, there's some guys downstairs want to meet you." And instantly, I'm thinking, "Oh my god, who, what's this about? Who knows? Who knows I'm here?" And I came downstairs, and it, it was a group of local historians and academics, and they just wanted to say hello to me and have a drink, have something to eat. And it's because for the last three or four years, they've been setting up a, uh, you would call it a pressure group, but it's not really that. It was more of a discussion group. And they were doing exactly what I was doing or intended to do. They wanted to research, well, what actually did happen at Pavlov's house? Because we're not sure he was in charge. We think it was this guy and we think the name of the house should be changed, which is completely accurate. So they wanted to meet me because they, they, couldn't get access to the archives that they were now giving me access to. So they wanted to know, what did you, you know, if you find anything there, please tell us. So they couldn't get access to it. No, no, no. They weren't, they couldn't get in there. So, uh, why is that? Lucky, that's what I'm saying. I'm a Western historian. I was, I was lucky enough that they wanted to, uh, to let me in. Uh, so there's, there's that too. So I've, I've, I've only had, I'm trying to think, I haven't had any, any criticism I haven't had. I haven't had anything online. I was expecting it, but I haven't had it. 
I've had one Russian lady in the UK at a literary festival come up to me and she was more critical of the fact that I don't speak or read Russian than what I was actually saying in the book. She didn't, she wasn't even critical of the book. She was more interested about that. And what I'd said to her obviously was, well, I don't, I'm just really interested. I speak, I can speak and read German to a degree that really helped me, but I can't speak or read Russian. And that's why I used three Russian translators on different levels, because yeah. I've got to get this material 101% accurate before I put it in the book. Uh, and I spent a lot of money and time and effort just on translating. I mean, I, uh, the archives, I came away with about 180,000 words of translated material. Uh, and that all had to get translated absolutely correctly. Otherwise, I couldn't. I, I wouldn't have used it because I, I, I can't afford to put something inaccurate in the book if I'm going to make this claim that, uh, well, this didn't happen, actually. It, it didn't happen the way they said it happened. Uh, yeah. So she was only a bit annoyed about that. Uh, but that was it. Apart from that, no, I, I, I would argue, I mean, it's out there. The book's been reviewed brilliant i'm so grateful it's been reviewed brilliantly in all the broadsheets in the uk like uh the times the sunday times the telegraph uh new statesman magazine uh develts reviewed it brilliantly in germany and uh, uh wall street journal and the washington post in the states so i'm very happy wonderful well uh ian i know our time is ticking down here um so uh final question if First of all, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank uh, you. It's been a great discussion. I've, I really, I've learned a lot. Um, if folks want to find you, if they want to uh, check out what you're up to, where can they find you? Are you uh, on social can, media? Yeah, social media. I'm on Instagram. Just type in my name. It's Ian with two I's, I-A-I-N, and then it's McGregor, M-A-C. Uh, so I'm on Instagram there. On Twitter, I'm at Ian underscore McGregor one. Uh, and then my website is www.ianmcgregor.com. And uh, you can email me on that site and I, I, I always reply. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Ian McGregor, The Lighthouse of Stalingrad, The Hidden Truth and the Heart of the Greatest Battle of World War II. Uh, go pick up a copy, go to your library, read it. Um, you'll learn a lot from it. And um, Ian, thank you so much. Thank you.